Dear Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, I would like to all cordially welcome you to the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. I'm very glad that so many of you have made it here into the 4th District. And uh, since you have completed this long journey from the International Centre, and since many of you uh, might not be that familiar with Vienna, might not be familiar with this institution, um, let me tell you a few things about us. Our main job here is to prepare talented young women and men for an international career. We are a professional school offering two different two-year master's programs and a year-long diploma program. What all of these programs have in common is that we teach them in a distinctly interdisciplinary manner, instructing our highly international student body in economics, law, history and political science. We also place a strong emphasis on the command of languages. Now, guess where international organizations in general, and the UN in particular, feature on uh, career wish lists of our student body? Um, many of them obviously put them on the very top. And it always gives me great pleasure when I go over to the International Center, and I usually see quite a few of our former students who have made it then across the Danube River. It also tells us something about the young generation that it believes in international organizations and believes in global governance, which I think should give us a lot of hope for the future. Now, a successful professional school cannot work without research and it most definitely cannot work without events like this. Um, so we are, amongst other things, also a forum on international affairs. And this very room, for this reason, is booked out for most of the year. Um, having said that, this AIDS conference is of special importance to us. It is dedicated to linking UN agencies with academia and civil society. In other words, it is an effort to contribute to global governance. Global governance is not old-style diplomacy. It is not secretive and it is not confined to state interaction. Instead, it is about a network of different actors and the communication that links them together. UN agencies, academic institutions, and civil society occupy crucial nodes in this network. At this point, let me emphasize this opportunity, let me use this opportunity and thank the organizers of this conference for the excellent job they have done and that they are doing, uh, and especially Michael Platzer for putting all of this together. It's a lot of work, but it really is a fantastic conference that we put together there every year. Thanks a lot. Global governance produces outcomes, produces outcomes of the highest salience for global politics, no matter whether that is in the field of security, economics, environment, health, migration, and so on. Today's talk is about such an outcome, UN peacekeeping. From its beginnings as an interposition force, UN peacekeeping has developed into a much more multifaceted and flexible instrument. It was during the cooperative 10 years or so before and after the end of the Cold War that the peacekeeping concept was fundamentally revisited. No longer is there only a military component, but there are strong civilian and police components as well. Peacekeeping, the often quoted chapter six and a half measure, clearly has matured. But this does not mean that the evolution of this crucial instrument has stopped. Peacekeeping as any instrument of conflict prevention, management, transformation, and evolution has to adapt to changing times. This leads me to tonight's talk, which is entitled The Future of UN Peacekeeping. And let me extend a very cordial welcome to Abby Odun Williams, uh, who's going to give this talk today. Uh, let me also stop at this point um, and give Michael um, the floor here, because he's going to introduce our speaker, and he's also going to introduce our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kwanbrook, and thank the Diplomatic Academy for giving us these facilities and also the close cooperation with our friends from the Defense Studies Academy who uh, finally launched this event. For those who don't know about it, there's a conference going on at the United Nations for the next two days, and those who don't still want to go should contact Maria Isamar, a graduate of the Diplomatic Academy, please stand. Okay, you may have some more problems, but there are people who might want to come over tomorrow 
The discussions were very interesting today, and tomorrow will be even more interesting. On Friday, students will be presenting their thoughts on what the UN should be doing. We will have a special award, an English award for the best student presentations. So we look forward to having you come over tomorrow, and also there are still tickets to the mayor's reception tomorrow evening at the Rot House, all the alcohol you can drink. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have uh, gotten Dr. Williams to come. He is a friend. We were colleagues in the United Nations. He's now Vice President of the U.S. Institute of Peace, and he concentrates on conflict zones such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, the Middle East, and North Africa. Uh, he was uh, Kofi Annan's uh, close uh, advisor on the responsibility to protect, but also on issues of strategic reform in the UN, uh, uh, as well as peace building and international migration. And he served in peacekeeping operations in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Haiti and um, Macedonia. Um, but he was an academic first, so he can, you can switch to uh, back and forth. Uh, he's uh, got an M uh, BA, MA honors from Edinburgh. I'm looking at my wife, who's also a graduate. That's it. Uh, she was very impressed with that. And a PhD from Fletcher School of Diplomacy. Uh, and he's published widely on conflict prevention, peacekeeping, uh, multilateral uh, negotiations. And uh, publications that are two pages long, so I won't read them all. Uh, he started off as a little boy in Sierra Leone, right? With uh, Camden Young Keller, so it's a, a long story uh, with a maybe a happy ending. Um, but Brigadier uh, General uh, Feitinga is also a, a unique person because he's an, he's an academic, has a PhD from Vienna University and has risen to one of the highest ranks in the Austrian military. He's a founding member of the International Society of Military Sciences and a regular contributor to the Austrian Military Journal. He has numerous publications on the former Yugoslavia, Afghanistan again, Iraq, Austrian security policy, and he's uh, frequently on television. Many people have seen him face on TV. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Irene Etzendorfer has been almost everywhere. I think uh, what I saw here on the list is now five pages, so I will summarize this very quickly. Uh, in Paris, studied in Paris, studied and uh, taught at Harvard, in Innsbruck, in Klagenfurt, in uh, Romania, I see at Dona University here, and has had many responsible uh, uh, job, jobs in terms of projects as well as cooperation. So we're very pleased to have her on our panel. Um, last but not least is my boss, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, his job this was supposed to be, but he said he would, so I'm doing it. Uh, He's a member of the Royal Swedish uh, Academy. Uh, he's a former professor at Emeritus of uh, Lund University, written many, many publications, and uh, has led us ably at the Academic Council of the UN. So I am right now to, to, to talk for about 40 minutes, and then hopefully there will be some discussion coming forward. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that kind and generous introduction. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here at the Diplomatic Academy at this event sponsored by the Academy Council on the UN System and uh, the Academy. Um, the Diplomatic Academy has a long tradition of producing graduates who have made significant contributions uh, to the field of diplomacy in general and to the work of the United Nations in particular. And I've had a number of opportunities to work with the graduates of the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, Michael mentioned that I began life as an academic 
And I recall in felicitous terms the very close relations that existed between the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, where I was a faculty member, and the Diplomatic Academy, and the regular exchanges we had between faculty and students at the Walsh School of Foreign Service and the faculty and students here at the Diplomatic Academy. So it's very nice to be back. Um, Shakespeare has a way of capturing our dilemmas in a nutshell. Uh, in Henry IV, part one, he puts into the mouth of Owen Glendower these words. I can call forth spirits from the last one. And Hotspur, who is a very pragmatic man, replies, Why, so can I, and so can any man. What will they come when you do call for them? And that, I think, captures the essential challenge you always face in peacekeeping. How do you get the spirits to respond when you call for them? And I illustrate this uh, throughout uh, the talk. One of the extraordinary things, uh, when one looks at the UN's role in peace and security, is the fact that the term peacekeeping cannot be found anywhere in the UN Charter. And it's extraordinary because it's a wonderful example of functional adaptation. When the collective security system, which had been set up by the founders of the UN, became paralyzed, uh, because of the competition between the superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. So peacekeeping emerged as a way to, to fill the vacuum and to end the paralysis. My basic views uh, this evening can be stated simply. First, although peacekeeping was not envisaged by the framers of the UN Charter, it will remain the UN's main operational tool to deal with threats to international peace and security for some time to come. And it will remain, I believe, one of the most demanding and visible aspects of the UN's conflict management work. Second, peacekeeping will remain a key instrument for conflict prevention, post-conflict stabilization, and burden sharing. And third, the United Nations can keep the peace when it is given the right mandate, resources, organizational structure, and consistent political support. And fourth, no other organization, nor the regional organization, nor the alliance, can substitute for the legal and moral authority of the United Nations. In thinking about the future of peacekeeping, I would like uh, to focus on three issues. The first would be the prerequisites for successful peacekeeping operations. Second, to say something about the challenges, quantitative and qualitative, facing UN peacekeeping. And third, to reflect on the important issue of sharing political space in peacekeeping and collective conflict management. Sharing political space between the United Nations and regional organizations in particular. Now on the first question on the prerequisites of successful peacekeeping operations, there are certain axiomatic prerequisites for successful peacekeeping operations, and these, I believe, will hold true uh, in the future. The first is, there must be a peace to keep. Back in the days of the Cold War, the United Nations sent peacekeepers only into places where there was a peace to keep. So impartial observers, civilian or military, lightly armed, blue helmeted, troops patrolled buffer zones between hostile parties. They monitored ceasefires and they helped defuse local conflicts 
allowing the search for durable political settlements to continue. Over the past 15, 20 years or so, UN peacekeepers have routinely been sent into areas where there is little or no peace to keep. And that is exactly, of course, what happened in former Yugoslavia and in Bosnia, where peacekeepers were pitchforked into an environment, really into the no man's land between peacekeeping and peace enforcement, with the disastrous results which happened. And the challenge, of course, now is that the UN was designed to stop wars between nations, not within nations. So the early days of peacekeeping were really fairly simple in retrospect, because you were trying to diffuse conflict between hostile parties, usually on a border, and now you have to deal with conflicts within nations. The second axiomatic prerequisite is that there must be a viable political process to support. A peacekeeping operation cannot serve as a substitute for the absence of a political process. What it can do is support a political process uh, to allow uh, warring factions to get together and to find a durable settlement uh, to conflict. And the third uh, axiomatic prerequisite is that a peacekeeping operation should have a clear, a credible, and an achievable mandate. Uh, the UN learned this to its cost in the tragedies of the 1990s. Now, if you don't know where you want to go, you will not go anywhere, or you will end up in a place you do not want to be. Again, if we look at the difficulties that Omkrafor faced in former Yugoslavia, we had over 80 or so uh, Security Council resolutions and presidential statements on Omkrafor and the situation uh, in former Yugoslavia. That is not the basis for a credible and a clear and achievable mandate in 80 or so resolutions. I think the fourth important factor is that clearly you have to have adequate resources and capabilities to implement the mandate. And there has been a tendency to pile additional tasks onto original mandates uh, by the Security Council with little or no consideration given to the resource implications of such enlargements. Um, and of course, part of the difficulty is that sometimes the Security Council uh, behaves uh, like a bad doctor. Um, every good medical doctor knows that if a patient comes and says, well, I'm suffering from an infection and the patient needs a course of antibiotics, the good doctor always prescribes a course of antibiotics and you always have the injunction, the medical injunction, make sure you take the entire course of antibiotics, don't stop even if you be begin to feel better. But what the Security Council often does is that it prescribes the cause of antibiotics and as soon as the patient begins to show signs of recovery, it moves elsewhere and the resources go elsewhere. And so you have the continuing problem of relapse in places where peacekeeping operations have been deployed. A good example of this, of course, is Haiti, where Michael Nelson also served in the late 1990s, where we had a successive of peacekeeping operations um, in the 90s, and then the UN left, and then the UN is back again, and is back again uh, in Haiti. So you have to have adequate material resources, you have to have the capabilities to implement the mandate. Um, fifth point, you have to have the cooperation of the parties. Uh, it is a sine qua non for success. If you don't have the cooperation of the parties, it is very difficult uh, to succeed. And finally, um, I would say you need the political will of the Security Council to see the job through, particularly the unified engagement and the support of the P5. Because one thing you can be absolutely sure about is that if the parties to a conflict sense that there are major divisions within the Security Council 
particularly major divisions among the P5, they will exploit it. And it makes it very difficult for those on the ground uh, to do the job. If you think of an example of a peacekeeping operation, which is generally recognized as having been fairly successful, which is the UN's unprecedented and unfollowed preventive mission in Macedonia, you can begin to see that all these prerequisites were there, and which had a lot to do with the success uh, of the mission in Macedonia. So even though, of course, the UN had difficulties with on before in Bosnia and elsewhere, you had a successful, a successful mission. Um, there's a verbal political process in, in place. The mandate was clear, it was credible, it was achievable, uh, very short. Um, uh, the Security Council asked the special representative of the Secretary General to use his good offices to, to help to bring about peace and stability in Macedonia, which was the political mandate. The military part of the mandate had to do with monitoring and reporting developments which could threaten Macedonia's stability. Um, you had adequate uh, material resources on the, and capabilities on the military side. You had a perfect match with about 500 uh, US peacekeepers. Macedonia was the first place where the United States deployed peacekeeping troops in the Balkans, and that was matched by the Nordic troops. Um, so you had the robust message which was being sent by US peacekeepers, and then with the long tradition of the Nordics in terms of peacekeeping. Um, and of course, you had uh, political support um, within the Security Council. I reflect again of Macedonia, since President Ligorov just passed away uh, on the 1st of January. And he, of course, demonstrated amongst more than all the leaders of uh, former Yugoslavia at the time, the foresight and the wisdom and the courageous statesmanship to say, I need help, which is also uh, critical if the UN is going to make a difference in terms of peacekeeping, particularly in a preventive <coughs> manner. And Gligorov had the confidence enough to recognize that he needed help and so requested the deployment of US uh, peacekeepers. The political will, of course, is critical uh, because what brought about the premature termination of this successful experiment in peacekeeping? Well, once China decided, uh, in response to the government at the time, uh, which had established diplomatic relations with Taiwan, once China decided that this was contrary to its own interests and its foreign policy, then, of course, the mission was terminated uh, um, uh, in February of 1999. So these uh, pre prerequisites, I think, are absolutely sound. Let me turn now to the second um, question, which is the challenges, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, facing UN peacekeeping. I think in a quantitative uh, sense, the numbers, of course, uh, speak for themselves. In 1997, the United Nations had less than 13,000 troops in the field. Today, there are 50 peacekeeping operations. Uh, with, about, well, near, with nearly 100,000 uniformed personnel deployed from 115 different countries. You have 5,500 international civilians in UN peacekeeping and about 13,000 national civilians. And only the United States has more personnel, military personnel, deployed worldwide. So it's this huge change and peacekeepers are serving in the most difficult places uh, in the world. So if you also look uh, at the budget, uh, one sees uh, the huge change. The annual budget for UN peacekeeping has increased from approximately a billion in 1997 to about 7.1 billion today. Huge, but it is still a real bargain in relative terms. Um, the United States is supposed to pay about 26% of the peacekeeping budget. And of course, the study of the General Accounting Office in, in Washington 
um, the study a few years ago which concluded that UN peacekeeping is eight times less expensive than funding a US, a US force, which is very compelling, and particularly um, in um, an environment of financial and budgetary constraints. The, um, in another example of this quantitative change, the Brahimi report, which um, Kofi Annan um, had actually um, brought about as Secretary General, uh, which was in 2000, had envisaged equipping uh, DPK, or the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, with capabilities to launch one uh, new multidisciplinary mission per year. So when Brahimi reported, he said, look, DPK has to have the capacity to launch this one multidisciplinary mission a year. And you're sitting there in the UN, in the SG's office, and the last two years of Adam's term as Secretary General, uh, we had to start up and expand nine field missions, which was three per year. So Brahimi was saying, you have to have the capacity to launch one mission a year. Last two years, we had to uh, launch nine field missions, three per year. Didn't even have the capacity to do one. And of course, the member states have this appetite to pile things on on the UN without, as I was saying, coming up with the adequate resources uh, to match. And of course, a Secretary General can pro uh, propose, but of course it's the member states who dispose. And even though Brahimi came very close in that report to saying that a Secretary General should say um, if these requirements and preconditions, which, which I've been mentioning, are not met, to say no to the council, but you, it would take a very brave Secretary General to be able to do that. Um, the costs of this surge, this quantitative change um, in peacekeeping, has come uh, with a cost. Uh, the first huge cost is that when you have a surge in peacekeeping, and uh, you have a growing and challenging uh, demand, what happens is that um, you do not have, um, certainly the senior management uh, in DPKO and elsewhere does not have the time to give the required attention which is needed, particularly in terms of reflection and review of strategy, of policy, of effective public communications, because it always comes at a cost. <coughs> and you also have a situation where uh, some of the missions, even some of the current missions, do not enjoy the full degree of member states' support. The second cost uh, is that when you have the priority to speed up deployment uh, to some missions, you're going to have uh, inadequate support which is going to be given to the ongoing missions. So there's always a trade-off. You have to set up the new missions so the ongoing missions uh, then suffer the cost. Um, and then I think you conti a continuing uh, problem is the shortage of experience and qualified staff particularly at the managerial levels. So hopefully the Diplomatic Academy will help to, to uh, uh, deal with this shortage and this, and this problem. Um, another point, I think, um, another cost is the inability to generate the troops and the key enabling capacities when you have too many operations. Peacekeeping is labor intensive, so it's labor intensive, and if it's labor intensive, numbers are important, and capabilities are important as well. A good illustration, you may recall, uh, not too long ago, was of course the difficulties um, that we, that the UN faced with in Darfur, because you didn't have troop contributors who were rushing in to give support to, to Darfur. And you remember, I'm sure, the saga of the helicopters which were needed in Darfur and you couldn't even have the helicopters which were needed, which would have uh, made a difference. 
A related uh, issue is, of course, now in many of the missions, uh, for example, in the DRC, you have part of the mandate, the protection of civilians mandate. And if you have the mandate to protect civilians, but you have very limited capacity in terms of troop numbers, in terms of equipment, in terms of intelligence, it is going to be tremendously difficult for uh, the UN uh, uh, to do a credible uh, job. And the final point uh, I would make is that you sometimes have inadequate training of units from the troop contributing countries and shortage of specialized units and, and personnel. And this is usually felt in three critical areas. One, logistics. Uh, second, uh, communications. And third, in terms of engineering. Uh, since the UN does not have its own army, so if Security Council mandates a mission, then of course the Secretary General with the help of DPKO and has to go around to Kabul every single time uh, the force goes, the, the formed units, uh, the civilian police, the, and of course the international civilian personnel to, to put it together. And sometimes, as in one of my missions, you would have the spectacle where in the depths of winter you have uh, an engineering uh, um, company which arrives uh, from a tropical country. We're grateful for it, but in the depths of winter, with no winter clothing in the middle uh, of winter. So those are some of the practical challenges that you sometimes have to, to deal with. Or in another mission, where, the, where I also served, and the helicopter arrives, and it has come from a mission in a tropical country. So finally you get the helicopter, and you're about to go out because you have to go see uh, um, uh, some of the troops who are deployed again in the middle of winter. So the helicopter ar arrives and you arrive at the airport and the MOVCON who control these things say, well, SRSG, there is good news and bad news. The good news is the helicopter has arrived. The bad news is, is there is no heating. <coughs> and so you have to fly for an hour and it's minus 27 degrees, I will always remember that. So you fly for an hour in a helicopter with no heating for minus 27 degrees on the ground. So you can just imagine what it is when you were uh, uh, a hundred, few hundred feet above. But those are some of the practical uh, uh, challenges that one has to, one has to confront. Um, now let me turn to the qualitative challenges uh, that you face, uh, that peacekeeping is, is facing. Because the, the quantitative challenges which I have mentioned uh, are only part of the story. And I think the, 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 the demands have become qualitatively more complex and will continue to be more complex. Um, in the first generation of the surge, immediately after the Cold War, um, you had successful peacekeeping operations which were deployed in Namibia, in Cambodia, El Salvador, Mozambique, and they had certain distinguishing features. The first, you had a countries, uh, all of those countries had a comprehensive peace settlement in place. Uh, I think the second important characteristic, again, uh, in all of those places, the P5 provided united support Third, the belligerents were limited in number, they were easily identifiable, and they were relatively cohesive. A fourth distinguishing characteristic is that the mandated peacekeeping tasks were relatively limited, and they focused on the transfer of state power. Um, another important uh, characteristic is that the areas of deployment, um, whether in Cambodia or El Salvador or Namibia, were relatively limited in size, and finally, the international troops deployed were largely self sustaining. If we look at the current uh, situation and the circumstances 
now present in the Sudan, in the DRC, in Côte d'Ivoire, in Haiti, we have a, an infinitely more complex uh, scenario. The first is that the peace agreements that the United Nations is starts to implement do not enjoy, usually, universal participation and support. For example, when the UN was deployed in the DRC, there was no peace to keep, even though some stakeholders had signed the peace agreement. And similarly, of course, in Darfur, we see that the Darfur peace agreement did not have the broad-based support that people who supported the signature of the agreement expected it, it would have. So, and you also have pressure to deploy traditional peacekeeping troops where there is no peace to keep in certain parts of the world. And nobody is coming forward to lead or even to contribute uh, multinational forces that would fill the gap. One huge difference. The second, I think, change is that the number of local factions now proliferates rapidly. And so what you have in these environments is a constellation of shifting alliances, uncertain alliances, and then of course lucrative opportunities for economic gain of the illicit kind, usually. You also have another change where you have strains among the P5. So the Hollywood period, immediately after the Cold War, has of course been replaced with uh, recent strains exacerbated by tensions. Um, we had, of course, the tensions over the Iraq war, we had the tensions over the global war on terror, and of course now, more recently, we have the tensions um, over Libya and the responsibility to protect. So all of those now have created tensions uh, among uh, P5. I think another um, change is that, of course, when we, one looks at the, the mandates, uh, in contrast to those relatively simple and straightforward mandates, you now have, of course, very complex mandates dealing with the state restoration, complex state restoration, and building processes after decades of, of conflict. And the operational challenges have also increased, so the areas of deployment are now far more extensive. So classic example, of course, is the DRC. So the DRC, the size of Western Europe. And if you look at the numbers um, which have been deployed in a country which is the size of Western Europe, you could just imagine uh, the scale uh, of the task. So the typical peacekeeping environment now is remote, it is austere, and you, you sometimes, of course, find factions which are openly hostile to a UN presence. Um, and in these settings, the lines of communication are uh, subject to frequent disruptions, um, local markets, goods, services are limited and non-existent. Uh, the troops, of course, and the staff sometimes lack the local language skills which are necessary to fully interact with the local populations. And then you have insufficient lead time to prepare, to plan, uh, and to deploy. Because one of the huge um, weaknesses um, the UN faces, and it will face in the future, is that it has no real rapid deployment capacity. Uh, again, I mentioned, I think, one of the reasons for the success in the Macedonian case was because um, the force deployed relatively rapidly. It usually takes, still takes about three months to, from the time the Security Council mandates a mission until you have all the different components in place. And this lack of a rapid deployment uh, uh, capacity is critical. I said at the outset that Shakespeare always has a way to capture our dilemmas and our problems in a nutshell. And this, if you think of um, the Merry Wives of Windsor, and Ford says, better three hours too soon than a minute too late. So 
applies perfectly also in peacekeeping. Because if you don't get there in time and you don't get there quickly enough, the political situation changes, the operational environment can change, and it makes it far more difficult to begin uh, uh, to deal with um, uh, these issues. Before I, I move on to, to the third uh, point um, about sharing political space in peacekeeping and collective, um, con collective conflict management, let me say something about uh, the challenge of governance, which I think is, is important and has relevance for peacekeeping. Because the UN is, is facing and will face in the future a major disconnect between those who decide, those who pay, and those who take the risk on the ground. Those who decide and those who authorize peacekeeping missions, of course, we're talking about the Security Council, which has primary responsibility under the Charter for the Maintenance of International Peace and Security. But this is a Security Council which is unrepresented, unreformed, and reflects the realities of power, political and economic, of the world of 1945. So this outmoded composition of the Council threatens its legitimacy. And with the threat to the legitimacy of the Council, it has implications uh, for its effectiveness. And I believe that if the Security Council is to be a stronger instrument for collective conflict management, and if it is to increase its ability to garner the widest possible support for its decisions, then it must be more broadly representative of world power and the realities of our times. So we clearly need an expanded, more representative, and thus more legitimate council, which will be appropriate for the 21st century. That's those who decide. Now those who pay, if we look at those who pay the bills, we talk about the United States, which is about 26, 27%. The EU as a group, 40%. Japan, 20%. So the United States, the EU, Japan, put in 87% of the bill. And the rest of the world paying 13%. Not a sustainable model, particularly in trying economic and financial at times. Now those who take the risks, those who provide the troops are largely now South Asia, so Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, always in the top numbers of troop contributors, the African countries stepping up, and some Latin American countries, especially in Haiti. So even the traditional supporters of peacekeeping in the 60s and 70s, the neutral countries and the small countries, the middle powers, the Nordic countries, Canada, not seen now in terms of commitment of troops and personnel on the ground. This would be quite shocking to Lester Pearson and Dad Hammarskjöld and those um, who laid the foundations of peacekeeping uh, in the early days. This again is some that challenge in the future which the organization needs to uh, confront. We certainly do not want to see apartheid in peacekeeping. It will go quite counter to the whole idea of peacekeeping and having the kind of forces which are put together, said in the way that Ralph Lange and Hannah Scholl and Pearson envisaged it, where you have those who are taking the risks and those who are shedding the blood essentially from the south and those who are paying essentially from the north. So I wanted to, to mention that um, because I think it is a cri another ch critical challenge which the UN will face in the future. Let me now turn to the third uh, and final issue that I wish to touch on, and that is the one 
regarding sharing political space uh, in conflict management, uh, especially between regional organizations and the United Nations. This is a major challenge. This question raises uh, important issues of legal authority uh, and important questions of political will and consideration of the optimum roles of regional and international organizations is both timely and necessary. New actors have emerged and old actors are redefining their roles. Since 1990, there have been some 22 cases of subcontracting or regional task sharing by the UN with regional organizations or multinational forces or lead nations in peace operations. This practice has been seen in the Balkans, in Afghanistan, in Haiti, in Timor-Leste, and a wide range of African cases. It can be integrated or joint. It can be coordinated. It can be parallel, and in some cases, sequential. There are three, uh, I think, um, I think there are certain questions really, uh, that flow from this challenge related to the UN's role. Uh, the first question is, should this outsourcing or subcontracting and hybrid operations be encouraged further? It's a critical question that the UN uh, will face in the future. And the second question, if this phenomenon is here to stay, how can it be improved? My own view is that it is far less problematic to work within the UN Charter than outside of it. And operational efficiency should be a key factor in how peace operations are to be structured. The UN Charter envisaged that the Security Council would have the primary role in the world's peace and security arrangements. It gave the Security Council unique legal authority. It was envisaged that regional organizations had an essential part in the conflict management process, but that these organizations should act within the framework of the UN Charter. The framers of the UN Charter wisely recognized that the original role should be within a wider construct of global order based on universal values. Breaking the nexus between regional operations and global institutions weakens the authority of universal values. And I believe that the special Asian, African, European or Middle Eastern contribution to the maintenance of global order should not be an exclusive exercise. Rather, it should remain the vanguard within an inclusive global institution. So sharing political space in conflict management is both desirable and achievable, but we have a long way, a very long way to go in consistently applying the optimum operational model for sharing the burden without diluting the effect. This brings me to my point about the unique qualities of UN peacekeeping. These qualities will be assets as the organization confronts the challenges of peacekeeping in the coming years. When it comes to peacekeeping, no other organization can match the UN's legal and moral authority. This authority rests on its charter and its universal and unique legitimacy. In an increasingly globalized world, legitimacy counts for more and more, not only in peacekeeping, but in a wide range of issues. The United Nations is one of the best vehicles for burden sharing and cost sharing, and the need for sharing burdens and sharing costs will only increase in the future. In peacekeeping in particular, the United Nations can be remarkably effective, 
flexible and much less costly than our alternatives. And no other organization has more experience or more tools for peacekeeping. So ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations is an indispensable instrument that can be used by the international community for the common good. It offers a unique forum, the organization, for trying to blend power and principle in an era of immense challenges and opportunities. Power in the service of principle, not principle in the service of power. And it is the blend of power and principle, vision and pragmatism that elevates politics into statecraft. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Abby, uh, for uh, a, a, a wonderful tool of voice here. Um, when uh, Michael Platz refers to me as his boss, he's uh, of course wrong. Uh, I am the present chair of the board of directors of, of uh, Aikens. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to turn over to Abby uh, in a few months' time. But um, Michael has ordered me to moderate this session, uh, so he's the boss. <laughs> uh, and uh, before we uh, uh, turn to the audience for uh, questions and so forth, we have uh, a few uh, discussants up on the podium. and. Uh, can make uh, hopefully rather brief comments, but uh, although it's such a rich topic uh, that it uh, really invites uh, long discussions. But I uh, turn to my left first to Dr. Eisenberg. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for your excellent presentation. Now I know the mastermind behind the papers. I had the opportunity to read over years and sampling all the ideas and that I only can agree what you said and try to bring in some additional food for thought. But I would like to start with, start with a personal experience on being in a tank and having minus 23 degrees outside. <coughs> it's a unique experience. I had it in my former life as a tank soldier 20 years ago in our post we had a, we had a training and it was at the end of January and we had minus, minus 23 degrees and the heating in my tank didn't work. So we had to start at 6 in the morning, the engine worked and they also had to work and we ended up in the late afternoon and it was already getting darker and darker and when you do not feel the skin and your hair in your nose and in your ears and everywhere, it's a uh, very unique experience. So I can imagine what the, what the pilots and, and the people in the helicopter had to feel. As a researcher, who I am nowadays, I always start with the first question that is, is it worth to consider with the topic? And looking to empirical findings, I can say yes. There is some empirical findings that especially UN peacekeeping works and it is worth to deal with. Uh, you mentioned the, a number of, that it is eight times cheaper than, than you, unilateral or multilateral peacekeeping. It's the first time I hear that high number, but there is some evidence that it is much cheaper than the unilateral peacekeeping efforts from single states or state, state or, or, or alliances. So UN is highly cost, effective and an efficient tool. So the first question for my side is answered. It makes sense to deal with the future of UN peacekeeping. <clears throat> so the next questions are coming up and we can say why peacekeeping, why UN peacekeeping, where, who and how. You mentioned already the preconditions and the environment for the current peacekeeping operations and maybe also for the future peacekeeping or peacekeeping operations, there will be a strong need for peacekeeping operations. 
Even if the global incidence of civil wars does not increase, it is reasonable to project growing instabilities in societies unable to absorb shocks and manage crises arising from transition of organized crime, environmental changes, resource scarcity, and economic downturns. If you look at the World Development Report of 2011, you, you see a note that on repeated and interlinked forms of violence, where it shows that 90% of civil wars in the 21st century occurred in countries that already had civil wars in the previous 30 years. What will it mean for the future? Will we go the same way along? And there will be a strong need for especially UN peacekeeping. You mentioned also the growing importance of protection of civilians and the concept of the principle of responsibility to protect. What will it mean in the future? Maybe a stronger engagement of the international community and international society? <coughs> Where will peacekeeping take place? Where will it happen? Empirical findings in that context are peacekeeping is very <clears throat> unlikely in conflicts in or near P5 states, in their near abroad. They are not interested, the international community in the near abroad. And feelings of historical responsibility for former colonies, political alliance ties, and strategic resources have not generally made peacekeeping more likely. Strong determinants of where enforcement missions deploy are the levels of mistrust and the number of factions involved in the fight. Enforcement missions in particular are more likely in less democratic countries and their past agreements have failed to keep peace. And also a decisive element, the higher the number of victims and killed people during a civil war is, the more likely UN peacekeeping is also. So you can look at the map. Where are current conflicts? Where were the civil wars during the last 30 years? And you can get some kind of feeling in the picture of where future peacekeeping operations will take place. Today's reality is that two-thirds of UN peacekeeping is in Africa. And you look at Africa in the future of about 2030 or 40, you know that bad environmental changes and the huge increase of the population really increased the number of problems and risks that are already there. So with us, we do not know whether it will change rapidly or strongly the engagement of, of UN peacekeeping in Africa. There will be some additional on other places, but I think Africa will be a strong place for UN peacekeeping in the future too. Who will do peacekeeping? UN mainly, single states, coalitions of the willing and maybe able or unable. <laughs> and that will not change <coughs> dramatically. The one, one point that could be considered in that context is what will it bring when Western states withdraw from Afghanistan within the next two years? Will it bring a change in their external engagement? Will they return more to UN peacekeeping? Will they stay on course in multilateral peacekeeping operations outside the EU with, under the umbrella of UN, but not as an EU UN mission? That is a question that will be open for the future and can have a huge impact on future UN peacekeeping operations. One one another point in that context is, will there be more place for private military and security companies? We heard already the problems of being able to act rapidly, to react rapidly, or to act rapidly, or to prevent rapidly. We know there is a strong delay, especially in UN engagement. And there are some considerations in the context to engage or to rely a little bit on private military and security companies. Are they the future enablers? Are they the breaches for UN peacekeeping operations? That could be a question that is worth to be considered or more discussed in details. And how will it 
be, how will UN peacekeeping be, look like in the future? Interoperability was, is one of the highest recommendations and prerequisites for UN peacekeeping operations. You mentioned the various configurations of cooperation, and we also have the example of AMISA, the African Union mission in Somalia, where African Union is providing troops, UN is providing and funding logistics package, EU is ensuring the payment of the contingent, and NATO is providing strategic aid. Is it, a, is it a picture of the future? Can it be a picture for the future? Also an interesting aspect that could be discussed a little bit more in detail. Three dominant trends in peacekeeping will persist. That is more or less for sure, as the experts inside and outside the United say. That is the proliferation of actors, the expansion of the agenda, and the growing complexity of conflict dynamics. And Mr. Alan Leroy Anders, Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, mentioned already about the characteristics that emerged already. And he said in that context, not only help countries to achieve some measure of reconciliation and national cohesion, but also to reach the first legitimate democratic government is a key element. Peacekeeping must be able to draw on new technologies, especially drones, and peacekeeping will need to show cost effectiveness. And UN especially have to continue efforts to achieve a coherent and integrated approach. So, Final remarks from my side and that development and look into the future. I see six big challenges to UN peacekeeping operations in particular. To achieve a common vision of main stakeholders on the purpose and the aim of an engagement. To overcome or to bridge the dilemma deriving from the Three peacekeeping principles, concept of the host state, impartiality, non resort to force, except in self defense, and the prioritized and overwhelming task of protecting civilians. It causes problems, it costs already problems, and it will cause problems in the future too. Third point to consider or be pre prepared for mission, mission creep. Mission creep means you start with a certain mandate with a certain set of tasks, and the environment is changing totally. You are forced to protect people now. It was not in the intention, it wasn't in the mandate for the first. So you have to prepare for that, because people do not accept in a situation of a crisis where they are in danger, when you say, we are not prepared for that, we are not equipped for that. So it has to be considered already in the phase of managing and setting up a mission. Fourth point, to establish and manage partnerships. Some analysts predict already success, especially of the end, depends on how the UN can leverage its partnership. And partnership can be many more. Another point is, I mentioned already, to bring back Western states to participate in UN peacekeeping with personnel. It will bring capacities, it would bring qualities, it would be a strong effort on a strategic level. And the big question to me is, will it change after 2014, after the withdrawal from Afghanistan? And finally, to make capability-based approach, as it is mentioned in, in many UN papers and documents, make it work, make it reality. And the cooperation of civil and military elements is no longer under question. It is a prerequisite and it is unavoidable. It is, a, it is indispensable for future engagement in UN peacekeeping missions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I now turn to uh, another, another dis discussion. Please, uh, Dr. Edson. Well, thank you very much. Actually, I should be kicked off the panel because I cannot provide any similar minus 20 degree <laughs> of the story. It's better for you. <laughs> even, even though I visited uh, a couple of UN missions, I've also had my adventures, uh, especially in Guatemala, where I was taken hostage <laughs> by unknown 
well, people in masks, and I had to swallow my invitation because I was well, actually uh, smart. Uh, I swallowed the invitation of the American Embassy because I thought this is in any case not advisable to show it. So, <laughs> anyway. We can exchange uh, our experience. <laughs> I've had many adventures in Cyprus, uh, mainly violating all the regulations that nobody cared. Anyway, so I would like to make comments on three different issues. Uh, first, uh, well, the development history, wonderfully depicted. Uh, second, the changing times. And uh, third, uh, you comment on the charter of the UN. Well, so I'd like to recall the huge, huge, huge difference uh, between, well, the first generation of peacekeeping missions, let's say Cyprus, uh, where we found more or less, more or less relaxed uh, blue helmets uh, on so-called beach keeping mission or sunshine mission, thinking about the private houses to be built with the money, observing a buffer zone uh, which would most probably have been uh, respected anyway. So this is the first generation and uh, the second generation were the huge failures uh, of the UN and the damage to their reputation stems from uh, the completely helpless UNO SOM 1 uh, troops in Somalia who could not even deliver the humanitarian goods uh, to the remote areas because everything was uh, looted already in the harbor of Mogadishu. So this is the this is the second generation where Chapter Six missions were deployed to hot civil wars to actually well fully fledged. Uh, war zones where only a very weak uh, consent was broken for a couple of weeks, like in Somalia, uh, with the leaders of the guerrilla. And after three weeks, of course, the so-called consent, uh, the invitation uh, necessary for Chapter 6 uh, was gone. So uh, we are moving here. And um, uh, I'd like to focus uh, on the changes the UN made because the UN underwent the sort of learning process. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be too negative. Because uh, what we could observe slowly, and it started with the resolution uh, 688 in Iraq already, uh, was a change of perception and not a change of the charter because the charter cannot be changed so easily. So, uh, mainly, there was a change in, in the meaning and in the scope of the security concept and, most important, of the concept of sovereignty, the principle of sovereignty. So, what we observe today is just a, just is a broader understanding of the notion of what is considered a threat to international peace and security. So, because uh, there was the shift from well, threat to peace is between states. Um, today, and starting with the 688 revolution, the threat is inside. The threat comes from inside the country, and the threat are internal reasons. So internal policies are framed as a threat to peace, and this is where it all started. Uh, this softened the norm of non-intervention, and uh, at the same time, the human rights uh, well, the regime has hardened, so to say. So, uh, this shift in the perception of the principle of sovereignty that, well, as uh, you find it in the Agenda for Peace from 1992, where the beautiful sentence uh, is written, well, principle of sovereignty, of course, <coughs> but the times of absolute sovereignties are over. This was the famous Plutus Plutus style sentence. So, uh, the shift to an understanding that sovereignty is first and foremost a duty, a responsibility to protect when a state is unable or unwilling to provide life-supporting principles and assistance to the people that are expected to request outside help and accept the help of outsiders. So, uh, should state obstruct this, there is an international responsibility to act. And 
the state is the principal provider of security. So then sovereignty may also be temporarily suspended. So in my understanding, this led to an ongoing reformulation of uh, the UN peacekeeping role to meet the new peace enforcement demands. And uh, these are increasing demands for intervention in internal wars with high civilian casualties, human rights uh, violation, and war crimes. Because every mission has to match the war scenarios. And these scenarios have changed. Let me, let me add for a minute this, uh, well, the essence of the change. There has been a change of warfare. Cyprus may be described as a, please don't misunderstand it, but as a relatively organized uh, conflict. There was a state army, the Turkish army, occupying 40% uh, of Cyprus. Actually, they wanted to take 30%, but uh, the other, the other uh, Greek uh, Cypriot army was so weak, so they took 40% in order to some, well, space for negotiation anyway, but it was an organized conflict. No non-state actors, no guerrilla warfare, uh, a buffer zone running through the country. Uh, these conflict scenarios are not to be found anymore. So what we see today and observe are that sub-state actors fight each other that the distinction, the crucial distinction between combatants and non-combatants is blurred or, well, has actually vanished. So there is no respect for the code of war. And uh, neither is there a respect for the UN troops as such. We, had, we, we observed so many violations and so many attacks on UN groups because there is no respect. This is a kind of regression to the state of nature also observed in the, in the warriors. And the warriors are no combatants, but I mean they can be labeled as, uh, as civilians actually, because they do not stick to the code of war. They are not organized, they do not wear uniforms, uh, they do not have clear command structures. So the argument here is that actually international law is not able to cover these conflicts anymore and that changes should also be made in international law, which actually goes hand in hand with the, the UN yeah, reforms. Well, anything else left to further discussions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Before turning it over to Abby, let me just add a few a little question to you, since I'm listed as a discussant also, right? Uh, you very well pointed to, to uh, the prerequisites and some of the challenges that, that you and peacekeeping faces. Uh, and uh, you deta detailed them very, very well. Uh, and yet you managed, by the end, to be fairly optimistic. Um, and my question is really, some of the factors you pointed to, are they uh, likely to change to the better in the future? I'm thinking, for instance, of, of, of uh, the lack of resources. Uh, with the uh, financial and fiscal crisis that is spreading, will states be willing in the future to contribute? We know, for instance, that already member states owe almost $4 billion in unpaid peacekeeping duties. Will, is it likely to be, be, be uh, a turn to, to better? Uh, the budget, I mean, it's impressive, the $7 billion budget, but some have referred to it as a shoestring budget uh, when, you, when you compare it to, to the tasks uh, ahead. It represents less than half of 1% of world military expenditures. And, and UN peacekeepers often complain that the UN has yet to come into the 1990s. In its <laughs> so, so, I mean, what do you see, do, do, what, or, or can you see any turn to the better on, on that? in that specific, specific field. And the other is, of course, the, the Security Council. Um, the Security Council has been very resistant to any reform. 
uh, and, and the uh, UN Under Secretary General uh, Alain Leroy, who uh, left office some time ago, uh, he made an interview where he said, and I quote, in crises of great strategic importance, NATO and the US go. For all other kinds of crises, they are happy to have UN peacekeepers go, and then we are scapegoated because we cannot protect 100% of those villages. So, um, I'm turning it to the pessimistic side, but I, I, I'd like to, to hear where you see uh, sort of signs of change to the better in, in the, the, all the problematic areas that you, you, you so, so well uh, uh, pointed out. I think it's time to turn it over. Okay, all right. Well, I will um, try to be brief because I want to um, give the audience uh, who've turned out to like an opportunity to fire questions as well. So you do not leave feeling frustrated that you didn't have an opportunity to have your say. I guess no one who gets into this business and this kind of work will do it if you're not fundamentally an optimist. I think you have to be. And I plead guilty to the charge. Uh, but I think really it, you, you have to, at least if you look at the evolution of peacekeeping and you look at the role of the UN, um, you know, there's a combination, as I said at the end, of realism and, and also optimism, and you need to balance both. You're right, I think one of the huge challenges, particularly in a um, constrained financial economic situation, is this model, which I mentioned, where you have a limited number of countries who are footing the bills. So as I said, that's an unsustainable model. So clearly, what I was implicitly suggesting is that other nations who are not exactly poor, and we can just scan around if you think of some of the Gulf states, the other states who are quite well, they have resources, I believe have to uh, shoulder a greater share of the financial burden for peacekeeping and also for the UN squad generally, rather than just saying there is a formula where we have assessments and we're going to stick by it. In very much the same way that I believe that the countries in the North, including Nordic countries, other Western countries, have to begin to put troops on the ground. So similarly, uh, this model has to change. Uh, so I think um, uh, you're right on that score. Um, just to respond to the central point, which I think uh, the professor made about sovereignty, I think it's really extraordinary, you're absolutely right, to see the change in the attitude towards sovereignty um, within the UN in the past 10 years. Of course, I always used to think when I would walk into the UN complex, symbolically you have all those flags which are fluttering in front of the UN complex on Turtle Bay, which are graphic representations of the principle of sovereignty and the importance of states who remain important actors in international uh, affairs. And then you have the Secretariat. And then at the back of it, you have in the UN garden, which is not as visible as those flags, you have the eternal flame in the Eleanor Roosevelt garden to the Universal Declaration. So it's a symbolic representation of where the Secretariat, the UN stands, always between the flags of the member state sovereignty and that garden at the back to Eleanor Roosevelt. But in the last 10 years, we now have remarkably this view that sovereignty um, is never meant and should not mean a shield behind which sovereigns can massacre and kill their own people. And which, of course, and the important development with the responsibility to protect um, in 2005, which was adopted by all the world the heads of state and government at the World Summit. I think one of the reasons, actually, why we were able to get um, an acceptance of the responsibility to protect is precisely because it recognizes that the primary responsibility to, perform, to protect citizens rests with the government. But it's only, of course, if a government is unable or unwilling to protect its own citizens, or if itself is a party 
to those crimes that the international community has a responsibility to protect. But I think an extraordinary development, an extraordinary change, and in 10 short years from the time that we had the ICISS Commission, uh, its report, and its invocation in the case of Libya last year, is quite uh, remarkable. Um, Brigadier General made a number of points. I agree um, with many of the points uh, um, you mentioned. I just uh, touch on two. Um, uh, one, on the importance of partnerships. I think in the last 10 years, the UN has learned and is learning that it cannot do everything on its own, and certainly including in peacekeeping. And it has to work with others. Um, so building partnerships with civil society, building partnerships with the private sector, which used to be taboo, and working with global constituencies uh, beyond member states. But it's certainly in the area of peacekeeping, as in other areas, it's humanitarian work and development, the member states have to enhance its capacity for all partnerships. Um, on the point on the role of private military and security companies, I was pleased that you posed it as a question and not as a point with which you agreed, because here it's something which I, I do not think would be in the best interests of in, in international collect, um, collective conflict management, even recognizing the tremendous challenges that face um, governments in monitoring peacekeeping uh, operations and collective management both at the regional and international level. My central concern is the lack of accountability that you have with private military and security companies. That's my essential concern. Uh, at least you have the accountability, political, which the Security Council provides, however difficult, you have the legitimacy which the organization provides, and with private military and security companies, um, you wouldn't have that. So let me just stop on those points. Okay, we, then we open the floor for questions. Mm. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Vanessa Tocano. I'm a doctoral student of the University of Vienna. Uh, my question is regarding responsibility. What happens when peacekeeping uh, forces commit abuses, crimes like rape, they unjustified destroy the, proper, the property of people? Uh, who is going to respond? Who is responsible for that? Who is going to pay for the, who is going to repair this damage? The UN is going to repair this damage? And uh, who would be the authority competent to decide on that? Would be the domestic judges? Thank you. Happy to respond. Yes, please. Let me check for my history card. Currently, I'm University Professor of Two Sides of the Atlantic. Um, I want to comment on two points. And my question's comments goes to go to Abby. The first one is, uh, I'm glad to touch upon private uh, security uh, as one of the serious issues. Um, considering some of the experiences, such as, for example, Dynacor in, in Bosnia, I mentioned just one, but there were more of them. Um, my question is, how do you see the possibility of preventing certain member states of sending subcontractors, because I think the process is going on. Um, what are practical measures? Because I fully agree, for me as a human rights lawyer, it's a horrifying perspective, and it links to the previous comment, because it even further waters down very imperfect accountability for violations of not only rules of conduct, by committing crimes, by human peacekeepers, which are exceptions to the rule, it's one percent or half percent, but whatever it is, you know, it's a serious issue which I think is rather encouraged by the by subcontracting. And my second question is related to your comment on lack of qualified staff for medium and senior management position in the United Nations. While I agree that there is no at hand qualified staff. I believe there are many qualified people all over the world, in all regions. So I think rather the, it's the question of 
shortcomings of the recruitment and high politicization of the process. Could you please comment about it? Let's see if we can to, to me. Thank you. My name is Sabin Reda. I worked uh, for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, now uh, with the Vienna University. Uh, my always uh, encouraged me to ask provocative questions because now I am an academic and only UN official. Uh, hence, it's coming. Uh, we heard about uh, Mogadishu, about Macedonia, about the involvement of the US troops, about the efficiency of uh, UN peacekeeping uh, 8 to 1. My question is to Abby. What would happen with the same mandate uh, if in Serebnica there were US troops? Good evening, my name is Margit Holzer. I represent the Austrian African Society. And I would like to ask uh, Mr. Williams um, about his personal opinion, his personal view about the situation in Nigeria that uh, yesterday evening um, um, uh, came to a very, very uh, dangerous uh, uh, extent. Uh, some of my friends, some diplomats described it that the, the country is uh, before the outbreak of a civil war. So I would like to know how do you personally see this situation and do you believe that uh, UN troops should move in? Um, what, what is your view about it? Okay. Um, with, and I just take the questions in the order, I think, in which um, yeah. they were posed just to be uh, more coherent. I think Vanessa raises an important point about um, to crimes which are committed by um, UN peacekeepers. I would say now that the UN takes this far more seriously than they did a decade ago. So I think that's an improvement, and you have um, Margaret Washington, I think, who is focused on, on this, and the special angle focused on this issue. Part of the difficulty you sometimes face was, as you, in terms of accountability because it's not a UN, um, you don't have a UN army. So part of the problem you often face if you have soldiers who are serving or part of national battalions, then the UN Secretary General wouldn't hold them accountable. You see. So what would some what would happen is they would have to go back to their national governments and back home and be left to those national governments actually to make sure that they are brought to justice and held to account. The second, um, my colleague, my colleague from the UN, who also, also served in, in Liberia in the human rights uh, section in, in Liberia, raised the question about what can you do to prevent member states who might be engaged in nefarious activity. Um, I'm tempted to say, well, it depends which member states, <laughs> because uh, all member states are equal, but some member states are more equal than others. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but let me just uh, say more, more seriously, I think that's where, in terms, where civil society comes, plays a critical role. Because I think one of the important roles that civil society can play is to hold member states accountable to hold organizations like the UN accountable, uh, to bring more transparency into the decision-making processes. So I think civil society, because of the kinds of noise that civil society can make, have, I would say, even more capacity to make sure that these member states uh, do the right thing, and if they fail to do the right thing, at least pressure is brought uh, onto them and they have to account. Um, I couldn't agree with you more about um, problems relating to the recruitment policies in the UN and particularly the politicization. I think one of the most distressing things in terms of the evolution of the UN is the destruction of the international civil service. Um, since we can be frank, that's what, that's what former UN colleagues have said, one of the 
great freedom of being a former UN official. You can say what you think. I think the destruction and the politicization of the international civil service is one of the um, most distressing things which have happened. But this is a political problem. And it is a, it's a problem, it's an issue which the Secretary General, any Secretary General on his own cannot fix. It's the member states who do the politicization and it is up to them if they want to recreate a civil service which is sound, which is impartial, which is with us. They have to be committed to it um, and they have to put together the funds and the resources to make it work. Um, my colleague from, from colleague from UNODC raised the question about Srebrenica and if you had US troops. Well, it's always difficult you know, to say what would have happened in, in, in hindsight if you, when you look at events in the past, which is very difficult. What I would say is, of course, um, the circumstances now and the attitude that we have now to mass atrocities to peacekeeping is very different than it was uh, at the time of Srebrenica. For example, um, in the early days of peacekeeping, certainly for the first 40 years, even right up to the deployment of former Yugoslavia, one of the principles of peacekeeping was neutrality. And neutrality was interpreted in the first 40 years of peacekeeping to mean that you didn't take sides. And one of the lessons of Srebrenica and one of the lessons of Rwanda is that you cannot remain neutral in the face of evil. And one can be partial, but that is not synonymous with neutrality. And on the final point, um, from a uh, representative from the Austrian African Society, terrible situation uh, in Nigeria. Um, one of the extraordinary things about Nigeria is the fact that it is held together for so long. In fact, um, in the run-up to independence, when the British were thinking of um, independence, there's a report which was done in the late 1950s, and they actually proposed that Nigeria should be three countries. It's often forgotten now. That was the proposal, but that didn't come through. So it's held together. They had a really terrible civil war in 67 to 1970 with the secession of Biafra. So it is such a diff most populous country in Africa, a hegemon in the region, and you have these deep currents um, which intersect against ethnic lines, religious lines, and of course now in terms of resources. So powerful factors, religion, um, ethnicity, and of course now with the oil, which fuels the continent. And now this very dangerous book around uh, dimension. <laughs> um, in terms of a possible role uh, um, for the UN, I think the, the trend usually now is, I think if there's going to be a role, you probably would have either ECOWAS or the African Union probably trying to play a role first before going to the UN. I think if the Nigerians <coughs> decide that they want to have external help and support of, a, of an international organization, you probably um, see ECOWAS or AU in the role before that. So, this. Uh, thank you very much. Erwin Schmiel from the Defense Academy in Vienna. Um, thank you for a very brilliant presentation which would give reasons for quite a number of questions. I'm just coming, uh, uh, would like to come to one point. You mentioned the unique experience of the United Nations in mounting peace operations. Um, now there are two organizations or institutions which have problems with institutional memory because of the high personal turnover and a number of other reasons. One is diplomacy and the other is the military and UN peacekeeping is a combination of both. And um, my personal impression is that uh, the problem which is faced not only by the UN of learning and implementing lessons, recognizing them, and uh, drawing conclusions from them is not in the best of shapes in the context of UN peacekeeping. 
Uh, one example just from the discussion right now, the question of accountability of UN personnel in peacekeeping operations. It's a question which was very well addressed in the 1958 report on the first emergency force. And in, in the years after that, which is now almost uh, 55 years, it was raised a number of times again. Or another point um, when we're talking about generations of peacekeeping, which are personally doubt, we, we can, we forgot, we tend to forget that in the very first peacekeeping operations, force was used. And these were not at all impartial when we think of the Congo operations. Um, and different forms of peacekeeping operations, and I prefer forms to generations, are still with us. Uh, never mind that they are, they are expanding. So if you could come to the issue of experience, I would very much uh, uh, thank you for that. Dr. Williams, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. My question uh, will be about the future of the United Nations and in the context of the further development. Um, what do you foresee about the role of China and Russia in the, the process of further development of the United Nations? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alvin Lusa, and uh, I happen to be a student. Uh, we get a general five things. Uh, this is something very, very important. And uh, as an African, uh, I am moved to you know, seek to know more about that. Uh, what is said is uh, Africa is uh, the next you know, epicenter for uh, international peacekeeping. And uh, maybe in the next 20 years, in the next 30 years. And I would like to ask a question. And that question is, uh, don't you think that there is anything that could be done to deflect the necessity of having to send the uh, international uh, peace uh, contingency uh, in Africa? And my second question is, uh, uh, from my perspective, I understand, although I am not, I'm not well versed in the, you know, international politics, I'm, but I'm still learning, and I want to learn. But my understanding when it comes to, you know, uh, coming to the Nanini, in terms of, you know, maintaining, keeping on maintaining international peace, uh, I think the problem is the failure of the members of the Security Council you know, to come to agreement when it, when it comes to you know, deciding how to do your um, international peacekeeping uh, contingencies. So how do you think uh, that in a, a situation where uh, the United States of America, Russia, China are jostling for upper hand, I don't think that uh, you can bring them together to actually work uh, for the maintenance of peace around the world. And second of all, I also do understand that each one of those members of the Security Council has their own <coughs> national and strategic interests whenever you know, uh, decision times come. So, and uh, that's one of uh, those reasons why that have led some countries like the United States to take a you know, um, unilateral, you know, steps or you know, movement. So how do you how do you deal how do you deal how do you effectively deal with situations like this? How do you how do you persuade them or how do you create a situation where the uh, you know the privileges uh, when it comes to national interest and the strategic interest could be breached? which I think if they could, would create an environment where we could see a uh, better world, more peaceful world. And then a final question here. My name is Mihashi Mori. I am an old, one of the old war horses of the UN system. And we learned that there are geostrategic, macro and micro politics of peacekeeping operations. It's a very complex system. But now I'm representing here 
the Hungarian United Nations Association, and in a way, the World Federation of UN Associations. In our association in Hungary, we learned that one of the best approach to peacekeeping from a national civil society organization is to get involved the former peacekeepers. In our UN association, we organized a group of former peacekeepers and former police officials who were also working in different police operations. We have about 450 members in this group. And their experiences are very interesting. And I think some of the international organizations, maybe the UN, maybe ECOWAS, should try to collect these experiences. And I think it is a collection of treasures because the micro problems of these people can be seen from the eyes or with the eyes of these people. So I just recommend this for you as a future head of ECOWAS. The first question, which touches on the example of the Defence Academy, raises an important question of institutional learning. Um, how do institutions, whether they're national or international institutions, how do they learn? This is a challenge not only for the UN, it's a challenge, I think, for foreign ministries, it's a challenge for defence ministries and defence departments, it's a challenge for regional organisations, so the CBEs. It's a challenge for um, the UN. It's a challenge also, of not only for public institutions, but for private um, institutions in the private sector. So it's a big issue and it's a complex one. All I will say is that uh, the final quest suggestion by Mr. Shimori is a partial answer to the first question which was posed. Because part of the answer to trying to deal with this challenge in the UN is to make sure that the organization does a better job of collecting the experiences, as we have just heard by Mr. Shimori, of peacekeepers, whether the military, whether the civ civilian police, whether the international civilian personnel, like right? me and others in this room, who have served to make sure that could have been one way of doing it, which the UN is now beginning to do, is to have debriefs of the SRSGs, on the civilian side of me, and to make sure that the force commanders, the civilian police commissioners all go back to, to um, uh, the UN and the DB. But it has to do a better job of doing this in a more uh, systematic way. Uh, one of the, way, the reasons why I wrote my book on Macedonia, Preventing War, the United Nations in Macedonia in 2000, and in, I did it not because I needed tenure, I left the academy, I did it not because I was going to, it would help my career in any way at the UN because they didn't look at publications for advancement, but purely for this reason, because I was deeply conscious. In fact, as an anecdote, uh, my first boss was Sergio de Mello. And Sergio, who was such a tremendous force in the UN, when I met him in 1994, on the first day uh, in Zagreb, he said, oh, after a few times, I think you should go to Macedonia. I said, why? He said, I think Sage said, because you're coming from an academic background, the UN is doing something extraordinary, which is never done before in Macedonia. He said, one day you might wish to write about it. Wasn't that prescient about, about it? And certainly, when I left, I thought, one needs to write about it. And the reason I did was to capture it, because I felt if the UN <coughs> is again in a position where it wants to mount a preventive deployment mission, at least there would be some record of it somewhere. Um, and it is couched in a relatively systematic way. Uh, on the second question about the role of China and Russia and the future development of the UN, uh, clearly as two of the, permanent, the five permanent members, they have a critical role on the whole range of issues that will confront the UN, but particularly uh, in the area of, of peace and security, because the role of those two are critical. As we have seen, of course, um, last year in, in Libya, in a, a positive way, but, uh, they did not stand in the way of uh, the resolutions authorizing um, intervention in Libya, and of course, as we're now seeing with the difficulties in Syria. So they play a critical role. Um, 
what in, in, in China's case, in terms of peacekeeping, one has seen a very interesting evolution in its approach to peacekeeping. Um, 30 years ago, China well, was not very keen on peacekeeping. Uh, it sat on every fence uh, possible and was not very keen in even having peacekeeping, or peacekeeping being discussed in the Security Council. Um, well, 10 years ago, I mentioned uh, the um, vetoing of the extension of Entredet in Macedonia because the new Macedonian government at the time had established relations uh, with Taiwan. But you now have Chinese peacekeepers in Haiti. So not only do you have Chinese peacekeepers in Haiti, but Haiti has had long historic relations with Taiwan. So the position of China is not fixed. It evolves uh, and it changes. So um, that's just an observation uh, and peacekeeping earlier. On Mr. Musa's question about how you get the P5 uh, to agree, all I, I will say is, um, of course, the challenge always is to identify the common interest and to build upon it. But I, it is not a in all instances, that the national interest is automatically antithetical to the international interest. The national interest can at times also encompass a broader international interest. And we hope that the P5 can, can take at critical times an enlightened understanding and an enlightened interpretation of what is in, in their own national interest. And if they take a broader conception of the international interest, then uh, you can have movement. And then, but it's not only at a philosophical <coughs> level, if you will, but their practical imperatives, which prompt them to take reasonable approaches. Financial, as I mentioned, when they're pressed and they look at the figures and say, well, if we want to do this on our own, it's going to cost us far more than working with the UN. Second, they think, well, um, we can do this on our own, but we need the legitimacy of the organization, and we can't get it anywhere, we can't confer it on ourselves, so it doesn't matter how strong the country can be, it can't confer legitimacy on itself, it's more than you confer democracy on anybody, because yeah. self-determination conferred by anybody else is a self-contradiction. And finally, of course, uh, they look around and they think, well, this issue might actually threaten us in the long term, and poses a direct threat. So all of those things can prompt uh, uh, them uh, to, to be within the council. And I've already addressed Mr. Shimon's point. There was a question directed, directed at you. You should have a chance to, to respond quickly to that. First of all, I, I know that there is no Africa. There are more than 50 countries, different conditions and all, all the differences we see there. I had the opportunity to travel to Sudan for since four years now. And I had to, to visit Darfur and in Yumamid and I also saw Amis and Amis now. And I see a future for international engagement in peacekeeping in the whole spectrum, from conflict prevention to peacemaking to peace peacekeeping and then to peace building the fact. But it, has not, it doesn't mean that international troops from outside Africa has to come in first, because there is a principle of ownership and that has to be followed. So what I see is the future of the whole spectrum of partnership, as was, as was mentioned, contributions from outside, from the decision-making process at the Security Council beginning, to external assistance, and may address the EU peace facility that is enabling the development of African peace capacities in a strong way. So that is the way I see future international engagement in a broad cooperation in the full spectrum according to peace and security. And I see it in a very positive way, but I also see a strong need for that. Okay, uh, we have come to the end of, of a uh, long evening and I think you, all of you would join me in thanking, uh, first of all, Andrew Williams, who also our discussion for a very informative uh, couple of hours. Thank you very much.
Um, first, uh, I'm from the Austrian Mission of the United Nations. I'd like to thank the President for his presentation and all other contributions, the panelists and of the public. Uh, we have a lot of uh, food for thoughts now. <laughs> but uh, since we are humans, I think we need also uh, food for a tennis stomach. That's why, <laughs> on behalf of the Austrian Mission, I would like, I would like to invite you to the neighborhood to a small exception. I think.